Okay, let's explore numerical integration a little more deeply in MATLAB. Now the first thing I'd like to do is go ahead and add up boxes, just as I did before. But before I had done this in the command window, this seems like the kind of thing that would make a good M file. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say edit, and I'll make up a name for the function. How about box int? Oops, int. There's no MATLAB command with that name, so let's hit that. This file does not exist. Do I want to create it? Absolutely. Let's do that. So first line is function, and then the name of the M file, name of the function I want. And to keep things tidy in the command window, I'm going to clear the command window. Now I'm going to be using the function over and over again, so it makes sense to define it as an anonymous function. So let's do this, and I'm going to use the same function I've used before for previous examples. Okay, I don't want to necessarily want to see it on the screen, so I'm going to put the semicolon there. And notice I don't have those dots in there yet. I don't think I'm going to be uh, doing a vector multiplication with this. I think I'm only going to be sending single numbers to x, so I think that'll be okay. If I start getting warnings from it later, I can always go ahead and just add in those dots later. Now you'll notice it seems to be objecting over here. It's got a warning. Orange is a warning. It's not an error. Hmm, warning found. Go to the next message. I'm going to come down here and it says the value assigned to variable f might be unused. Well, duh, of course it is. I'm not done writing the file yet. So it's trying to take care of me, but it's getting a little overcautious here, I think. Anyway, that's all that means. So let's see, what am I going to need next? Let's define the end of the integration range. We'll assume the beginning is 0, I'm, so I'm not going to define x initial, although you could. If you wanted to, that would be fine. Next thing I'm going to do is give it a number of boxes I want to use. n seems like a pretty good number. And dx is going to be x final. Now if I hit just see how it, it's anticipating what I want, if I just hit tab, it accepts it. Again, I don't want this to go to the screen. Now, I'm going to use a variable to start summing up the areas of the individual boxes. Let's go ahead and define that right now, because I'm going to need it. I'll show you why here in a second. And I'm going to do this as a loop. j is going to increment from 1 to n, and j is going to be the box number. So the next thing I'm going to need for each box is I'm going to need to know what the left-hand side of the box is. Now here's where I have to decide whether I want the left-hand side of the box or the right-hand side of the box. Let's go ahead and use the left-hand side of the box. So that's going to be dx times now j minus 1. The first time through this loop, j is going to be 1, which makes x, if I just use j, that'll be the very first time through the loop, x will be dx. Mm, that's not what I want. I want x to be 0. So I'm going to start with j minus 1. That'll give me the left-hand side of the box. If I omitted that minus 1, I would be getting the right-hand side of the box, which is OK, too. But we talked about on the board using the left-hand side of the box. So let's stick with that. So let's add the area of each box to the summation of all the areas before it. All right, so the area of each box, the height is f of x and the width is dx. So I'm just going to add that to a. And I think that's all I need, isn't it? So I'm going to hit end. That'll close the loop. So capital A is now the area under the curve from 0 to 10. But I haven't actually had it send anything to the screen yet. That would help, wouldn't it? Because right now I've, I've got the value. It, the MATLAB knows it, but it, I haven't asked it to tell me what it is. Let's fix that. So after this, I'm going to say display. And what display does is sends a value to the screen. Well, I'm going to assemble a couple of string variables and have it just send those to the screen for me. So how about if I say area space equal, and I want another space there. Now, this left bracket there and right bracket there, those square brackets, those indicate that whatever lives inside there is an array vector in this case, and 
I've already added one string variable in there. So how about if I take the answer and turn into it into a string variable as well? There's a command called num2string. There it is. So that looks like that ought to work. And now I can say return. That, that uh, ends the function. So shall we try this and see if this works? Hmm, 66715. What do we think? Do we think that's, a, that's the right answer or not, or getting close to the right answer? Do you remember what the right answer was? So we're close, but we could do better. Well, how are we going to get closer? How about if we make n a whole bunch bigger? And we'll run now. Hmm, 66479. That looks pretty close to the right answer. Well, should we up it again? This is quite a lot. Let's hit run, run again. Hmm, that's looking pretty good. I wonder how long this is taking to run. If we make this one bigger, you'd think the run time's going to get longer, don't you? So let's let's run it again. Hmm, so see, it's only changing now in this, let's see, one, two, three, four, fifth decimal place. So we've pretty much got a converged answer. But it would be nice to know how long it took this to run. Let's try something here. Right here, I'm going to write the command TIC, tick. And down here, I'm going to write talk. So tick talk, I guess, is the name the sound clocks make, old mechanical clocks. And so in MATLAB, tick starts a timer and talk ends the timer. And it'll tell me how long it took to run on my little computer. So I'm going to go ahead and hit that run again. Let's see what we get. So the elapsed time looks like, oh, about 11 or 12 milliseconds. So not very long. Well, what happens if I make, I don't need more boxes here, but let's just add some for the sake of the demo here. Uh, so 12 milliseconds. Hmm, now I got it up to 47 milliseconds. And you'll see right now the answer's not changing. We've got a converged solution. So we don't need this enormous number of boxes. Now you might be thinking, well, I ran a million boxes in 47 milliseconds. Why do I care? Why do I care about efficiency? Well, this example is very, very simple. So evaluating this function in line four right there, Evaluating that function once is nearly free. In some cases, though, evaluating the function is not nearly free. It actually takes a significant amount of computer time. And so the game we're playing is always trying to get the right answer, or a, an accurate enough answer, with as few function evaluations as possible. So what would happen if I decided to use, instead of the left side of the box, I used the midpoint? Would that work better? Well, it's pretty easy to try. While we're debugging, let's go ahead and cut this down to something halfway sane. And right now we're on the left side of the box. So what's, where's the midpoint? Well, the midpoint is dx over 2. So let's just add that. And I'm not, I'm not wor too worried about whether it's possible to make this tidy or not. We're not that interested in efficiency. So let's go ahead and run this again. Hmm. Boy, that's a lot closer with only 100 boxes. Instead of going to some insane number, let's just bump it up. Instead of an order of magnitude at a time, let's just multiply it by 2. And remembering that the right, num right answer is, I think, 6645. Well, there we go. And we did that in about, oh, a millisecond. Right? So going to midpoint got us a much better answer much more quickly. Well, that was pretty tidy. Is there a way we could modify this to show convergence as n increased? Sure, let's try that. Now, if we're going to want uh, to run a bunch of different n's, I suppose I could run this over and over again and somehow write the n's down and put them in a plot. That, that would work. A um, little clumsy. How about we put another loop outside of this one and we vary n? Let's try that. So I don't need this anymore. I'm going to comment this out. Now I'm going to comment out commands for a while until I'm sure I don't need them and then I'll delete them. By the way, let's, let's put that in there just to remind ourselves what we're doing. Remember, there's no such thing as too many comments in your code. I've heard that 
uh, one of the guidelines is that if two-thirds of your code is white space or comments, that's about right. I'm not doing that here because I'm trying to fit everything on this little screen. But definitely go for space. Space is free. MATLAB gets rid of all the comments and all your white space before it runs, so it doesn't slow you down at all. And it makes your code much more readable. Readable code is easier to work with, it's easier to maintain, and it's easier to, to upgrade when you need to. So go for space, go for comments. Now let's maybe step in up, maybe 10 points at a time. So what I'm going to do here is, is I'm going to say 4i equals 1 to 10. I'm going to make another counter called i. And now i got to do a little bit of housekeeping here. Oh, right there, I'll get everything to line up. And I'm going to, right here, I'm going to say that n equals i times 10. Whoops, that's an equal, not a minus. That looks better. So for the first time through the, loop, the outer loop here, n is going to be 10, then 20, then 30, then 40, up to 100. And we can change that, that number there if we need to. So dx is going to change. Now, let's put that there. If I had started this from the beginning, MATLAB would have done all this indenting for me. But I'm going to go ahead and, and do it here manually. So every time through this loop is going to be a different value of n. So the next thing I probably want to do is I want to save the answers. I've got a value of n and a value of a calculated every time I go through that loop. But once i indexes, that's going to get thrown away. By the way, you see over here? It's complaining at me. There's no n there. Yeah, I know. I'm working on it. Lighten up. So how about let's do this. Let's say area. Whoops. I want to do lowercase. Area sub i, because remember this counter here is indexing the outer the outer loop here is the counter is i so area sub i equals a that's my area there i don't necessarily want it to go to the screen and let's say little n sub i equals big n now could i have put this in there yeah i could have it's a little easier to read this way, and this reassignment takes almost no time. So I'm going to go ahead and run it this way. And I don't want to display now. What I really want to do is I want to plot. Let's say n and area. Those should have the same lengths now. And I'll turn the grid on. Well, I think this is going to run. Let's do a couple things here. Let's give myself another little more room here. You can see I was messing around with it. That, that changed. I'm going to clear that. And it's going to be a convergence plot. We probably want to put some dots on there. So how about let's go with blue circles and let's put lines between them. B means blue. That lowercase o, not zero, but o, says make the marker a circle. And that line right there says draw a line between all the points. So what's it complaining about over here? Uh, nothing there. Let's see, variables to change size on every loop iteration. Consider pre-allocating for speed. Yeah, I know. If I want to make this more efficient, I, you know, because area is a vector, I can define a vector of areas and make them all zero before here. I can do that if I want. Now, the advantage is it isn't having to move, uh, increase the vector length every time I come through the loop, and it'll run faster. Now, in this case, I don't really care. If efficiency, if runtime becomes a problem, we'll probably want to change that. As you can see, I've got tick and talk here. So let's run this and see what we get. Well, there's my plot. That looks pretty good. See, I started out with a not too good answer, and it, it converged very quickly using this midpoint rule. 
you can see that by the time you get to 70 or 80 points, you're hardly changing the answer at all. Now, if you want to use the trap Z command, things get a lot tidier. The, the M file can be a lot shorter. So let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Remember, we have it over here. It's, it's still sitting over there. So we can call it back anytime we want. Let's make another M file. Now, I can't call it that because there's already a command called trap Z. In fact, we're going to use that command. Let's do this, trap Z int. I'm pretty sure there's no command in MATLAB with that name. So file doesn't exist. You want to create it? Why, yes, I do. OK, let's call it trap, write that out, trap Z int. And as always, let's just clear this, clear the command window. Now, before we used loops to calculate all the values of f uh, given x's, we don't, we're not going to do that this time. We're going to do everything as a vector calculation. So let's, let's give ourselves a, let's make it 10. Let's make it something really simple here. Okay, let's put that there. dx equals Okay, I've got that. Now, how, how do you want to do this? Let's make a list of x's that goes from 0 in steps of dx to x final. Now, I didn't need to do, use a loop to make that. This command right here made a list of x's for me. All right. Let's make a list of fun, uh, function values to go with it. So I want to see those. Okay, now before, I didn't need the dots in there because I wasn't uh, sending vectors to my anonymous function. Well, I'm sending vectors through here. That's a vector of x's, and I want to calculate f using that vector of x's. So I do need those dots in here. Okay, we're just going to throw an error. So there's that. And let's call it capital A here. Trap Z, X, comma, F. There. Now, so far, it isn't sending anything to the screen. Let's, let's use that display command again. Space equal, because you have to put the space in there. And then num 2 str A. That's it. And that'll run, I think. Hmm. Well, that's not too far from the right answer. It looks like we might be onto something here. Let's go, and that's that's pretty good considering how few values of n we had. Let's let's be real stingy here. Okay, now notice it went the, the error is changing here. All right, ready? Ooh, look at that. 6645 is the right answer. We're awfully close. Let's be a little, let's also be a little stingy here. And let's just bump it up a little. Look at that. There's about the right answer. So as we suspected, trap Z is a lot more efficient. It's, it's a better way to find areas, which is probably the reason it's a function inside MATLAB. It does work a lot better than just simple, simply adding up boxes. Now, I've mentioned Simpson's rule. Let's take a look at that next. Now, a general Simpson's rule function is going to take a lot more room than I have on the screen here, and I think would probably impose on your patience a bit to watch me write all this stuff out. But let me go ahead and write out the really important part of this. We'll, we'll do it inside the command window. So I'm going to get rid of that. Now, remember, I still have my command over here. I can still use, pull that back up whenever I want. I'm going to do that. I am going to go ahead and define this anonymous function again. Okay, so I have it now. And let's pick three points. Let's say x0 equals 0. x1, whoops, equals maybe 0 0.5. And x2 equals 1. Now, this corresponds to a dx of 0.5. Well, 
Let's go ahead now and make that matrix I wrote out on the screen. I need to call it something. I guess I'll call it M. The first row is x0 squared space x0 space 1 x1 squared x1 1 x2 squared x2 1 so there's my matrix now when I hit return I'm gonna get numbers here there they are now I'm gonna need a vector of values of f so I'm gonna call maybe y0 equals f of x0 and I'll go ahead and let that echo to the screen All right y1 equals f of x1 I don't need to see that y2 equals f of x2 all right so we have all the x's and all the y's defined we've got this matrix defined that I, I showed on the board in the previous video the next thing we need is a b and c now even though i have y0 y1 y2 they don't live in a matrix yet or a vector see there's just there's just a list of them over there so let's say b equals y0 y1 y2 Ooh, not o zero there we go now the semicolons right there means these are individual rows so this is a column vector here and that semicolon just says don't send it to the screen so if you look over here see b is a vector here and those are the values that that live in it let's find out what a b and c are so let's say i n v m times b okay those are my coefficients a b and c now we've calculated values for a b and c but we haven't assigned them in anything yet let's go ahead and try this all right there we go i now have a vector called c and inside that vector lives the coefficients for the quadratic polynomial now it'd be interesting to see how the quadratic approximation compares to the exact function well let's go ahead and make some vectors plot them and see how we do so let's make x go from zero and i'm going to give this fairly small steps and i'll make it go to about four now it would be nice to see what this looks like on a plot let's see how our polynomial approximation compares to the original function so let's go ahead and make a vector of both of those and plot them together on the same axes. Now, I'm going to have a problem here. Right there, I didn't put those dots in there because at the time, I didn't think I was going to be sending vectors to this. Well, I am. So let's go ahead and fix that. Let's make a list of x's. Let's go from 0 and let's go by steps of 0.01. I want to make this plot nice and smooth. And let's go to about 4. We only expect the polynomial to be useful between 0 and 1 because that was the outer bounds that we gave it. But let's look all the way out to 4 just to see how the error builds. Let's say maybe f exact, my anonymous function. Don't need to see the result. Okay, let's go ahead and write out f poly. Whoops, right there. F poly for polynomial and I'm going to go c1 times x now I really do need to put the dot here so c1 times x squared now we put some spaces in here to make it easy to read x times x whoops that's going to be c2 not c1 sorry and now just a little little comment on the bookkeeping here when you write out polynomials on paper a lot of times the subscript on the constant is the same as the power so you'd say a polynomial would be c2 x squared plus c1 x plus c0 and that's nice except two things are going on here the first is that MATLAB wants these in order and the way I calculated it c1 happened to correspond to x squared c2 is x and c3 is is x to the zero power and the other one is there's no such thing as a zero index. You can't do that. 
if I asked it for C sub zero, it would give me an error. In fact, here I'll show you. If I say that, if I type that by accident saying, well, give me the, the coefficient for the zero uh, power, it's going to yell at me. That's, that it has to be a positive integer. Some computer languages start indices at zero and some start them at one. MATLAB starts them at one. So anyway, let's clear this out, clear the command window, and let's now make our plot. So X, and we'll say F of ex F exact here, and let's make that blue perhaps, and then X and F poly, and make that maybe red. That'll be easy to see on the screen, and turn the grid on. Okay. Now, let's see what we got here. By the way, Shall we do this? Let's, let's put a legend on there. Let me go back to here. Oops, there we go. Go back to here and say legend. The first thing we plotted was exact. The second thing we plotted, whoops, plotted was a quadratic approximation. I spell that right? I think I spelled that right. And let's pull that plot back up here. So we've got that ooh, tiny, tiny, tiny letters. Let's fix that too. I right clicked font. Let's make that something big we can see. Ah, that's what you call more gooder right there. Okay, got it. Well, how does that look? Well, down here, it's not great, but it's not terrible. Out here, it really is terrible, but we only expect it to be valid between zero and one. Well, let's, let's, let's zoom in there a little bit. So I click over here and just highlight that. Well, you know, it doesn't look like it would be too bad. It's under predicting there, over predicting there. Well, those two look like they might actually cancel out, uh, well, at least partially cancel out. So in this particular case, it might get away with it. You can see how, I mean, I'll use the wheel on my mouse to zoom out here. The other way to do it is right click and just stay, say restore view, that with it between zero and one, eh, it's not actually that bad. If I were to make delta x smaller, reasonable to, to, to suspect that the approximation would be better, and that successive ones of these would give me a pretty accurate answer. But you can see how this got kind of involved. In practice, trapezoidal rules probably as good as anything. You can go to the extra complication of Simpson's rule if you want. My guess is you won't need it most of the time. But here it is in case you need it. So I hope this helps, and we'll talk to you next time.